All right, so in this talk, I'll, um, I'll try to give a bird's eye view of some of the activities that we're doing at Chalmers related to um, cooperative intelligent transportation systems. And uh, I'm here just as a spokesperson. I represent the work of many, many people across different divisions in our department. So what is the future of transportation? One way to look at this is, is as follows. And this is really from the point of view of a city, um, a city such as Gothenburg, where uh, more and more people are going to the city. Right? People are migrating to Sweden. People are migrating from the countryside to the city. So cities are densifying. At the same time, um, the transportation infrastructure, the transportation system is not changing very much. This is a relatively old city. We cannot build wider roads. We, we can not just change the roads as we want. So we have to use what is there more efficiently. Otherwise, we will get just a terrible gridlock all day long. All right. So how can uh, people coming from, say, communication help? Uh, so I'm a communication engineer. I, I wonder how can I help this in this big societal problem? And there's many ways that we try to help. And so in, in this talk, I'll give a, an overview. So one thing that we do, and this refers back to, to the keynote, is that we try to do fast and accurate positioning using future wireless signals. We also try to work on fast communication, and we explore a, a relation between communication and localization that's maybe a little bit different than what was talked about so far. We also work on control. We try to do microscopic traffic control, which means that we try to actuate vehicles at a microscopic level. So the the, the steering wheel and the braking and, braking and acceleration in a cooperative manner. So vehicles are solving an optimization problem together. And of course, communication plays a role there. We also work on macroscopic traffic control. So we try to optimize um, how a city operates in terms of traffic lights, the phases of traffic lights, and routing of vehicles. And I guess this connects a little bit to the, to the Timon project. So for each of these areas, I'll spend one or two slides just to give a little bit of a flavor of what we're doing. So I'll start with the first area. Uh, OK, before I do that, um, all of this is done, of course, in the context of multiple projects. Uh, so here are some of the projects that we're working in. So basically, what we do at Chalmers is we, we're involved in many projects at a national and international level. These are maybe listed on the bottom, also in collaboration with uh, companies and funding agencies. And then we rebrand them internally, such that each project starts, starts with a C. So at Chalmers, everything starts with a C. So we have the Coplar project, the Copna project, the COVID project, and many other projects. Uh, so in Coplar, for instance, we're trying to demonstrate at Asta Zero our testing ground, which some of you, I think, will visit on Wednesday, cooperation between just two vehicles uh, for shared perception and shared control. So there's just the first steps towards uh, doing cooperative ITS. And these other projects are more on a theoretical level. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about this project. If you have more questions, just come ask me. Okay, so now the different areas. So one of the areas that we're working on is fast and precise positioning using 5G signals. And this really relates again to, to Professor Tufferson's talk. So what we're trying to do is by sending signal from one base station or a reference station with a known position to a user with an unknown position and also an unknown orientation from the waveform, we try to estimate the position and the orientation. And that, I think, is, is something new with respect to traditional positioning. Because in traditional positioning, you would need multiple reference stations, typically three or four. And here, we can also get the orientation. So the, you have the position of a device. But for a fixed position, we can also, in 3D, in principle, estimate orientation by sending smart type of signals over multiple antennas from a transmitter to a user. So and, and as a kind of performance indicator, and here I'm using the same metric as uh, Stefan noted in, in his talk earlier. So it's basically the Fisher information and Kramer rail bound. So I'm plotting here the position error bound. This tells you how well can you position a device when it is located in a two-dimensional space and multiple beams are sent from a, a base station here or a reference station here. So you can imagine a reference station here sending actually two beams in this direction and one beam downward. And here I'm evaluating how well I can position a device. And red is bad and green and blue is good. Kay. So what it turns out is that when you're inside of the beams, of the transmitter, you, you have a high SNR and you can position yourself well. When you're outside of the beams, you have low SNR, you cannot position yourself well at all. But you actually need more than one beam. If you're just inside of one beam, it's not very good for positioning. And the reason is that you can estimate distances very well through time of arrival, but you cannot estimate angles very well. And you need angles and distances together to do positioning. So you need actually to be inside of two beams. And the same, you can also do a rotation error bound. So this is how well I can determine my rotation. Um, and again, red is bad, and then green and blue are, are good. 
So when I'm inside of the two beams, I can estimate my location very precisely, outside not so well. So this, I think, creates a nice interplay between positioning and communication, right? So if, you're, if you know more or less, where if you have some prior information of where you are and the transmitter beams to you, you can improve your positioning a lot. But of course, how do you get this initial position estimate? Okay. And then if, if you want to communicate towards the user, you need to know something of where the user is to send the energy that direction, especially for millimeter wave. Yeah, we're trying to explore these connections. A second area, area is that we're trying to explore the connection between positioning and communication. And what we're trying to do here is, is maybe not so relevant for cars, so we will work more with robots. Um, and this is, uh, I'll show you a movie basically about the following scenario. So we basically have a base station and a transmitter far separated far away so they cannot communicate directly. And the transmitter is sending, let's say, a video stream towards the base station. And what we do is we use multiple robots that serve as relays and they configure us out themselves in the environment to have optimal end-to-end -end throughput. Okay. So they're basically solving cooperative, cooperatively an optimization problem to reposition themselves to optimize the throughput. And of course, if the transmitter is moving, then the robots should readjust themselves. So I'll show a, sh a short movie of how this works. How this works. So, okay. I think it's just two minutes. So this, this serves as the base station. It's not a real base station, but it's uh, the transmitter. And then the robots, they will find their optimal locations based on, on the propagation channel in principle. So no wires. <laughs> yeah, this was hard to get to no, the no wire stage. Okay, so if, the, if this guy moves the transmitter, the robot should readjust to provide optimal end-to-end -end throughput. And these are some of the technical details here. So in reality, we didn't optimize end-to-end -end throughput. We did, we did a simple uh, optimization problem, but it just served as a proof of concept. And though, even though our facilities may seem very nice here at Chalmers, we're actually relatively poor at an individual researcher level. So we do our, uh, our experiments in uh, places that are not intended for this, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this was an example of how communication and localization connect in a way that's maybe not so obvious. And I, I cannot see a direct application for vehicles, right? You do not want to position your vehicles in a new way just to optimize your, your communication, <laughs> but uh, something to think about. Um, another connection that we're exploring is uh, beaming towards a certain user. So this is here a car. Uh, you have some prior information of where the car is, and then you want to beam signals towards that car. And based on the amount of prior information you have, what you can do is you can reduce the number of beams that you need to send. So a millimeter wave, how two devices communicate is as follows. You have many antennas here, so you can send a very narrow beam. Right? But if you don't know where the, tr the receiver is, you cannot use that very narrow beam yet. You have to first figure out where the receiver is, more or less. So you would first send basically a bunch of broad beams, and then the receiver would report, ah, the, the second beam was the best one. And then you, you will narrow your search. You send a number of narrower beams, and then the receiver says, ah, this, this first one was the best one. And you refine, and you refine, and you refine, and this takes some time. Right. But of course, if you have some prior position information of the receiver, then you, then you have some implied angle information of the receiver, and you can just narrow your search to a certain spatial region. So as an example here, you have the distance of the car from the base station, and this is how much time it takes to do channel estimation. And what you see is that when you don't have any prior information, the time is fixed because you need to send the, the broad beams, narrower and narrower beams until you've pinpointed the user. If you have some prior information, especially when the user is very, very far away, you can have a very narrow angle of departure region to which you send the beams. So you can do the, the, the pairing of two nodes much, much faster than without location information. This is uh, another way that location information can help in a 5G millimeter wave communication. Here everything is line of sight and kind of super benign, but it shows the idea. Uh, this is the third area, microscopic traffic control. So here we work with the people from control theory to solve optimization problems for multiple cars. So an example would be that you have two cars or multiple cars approaching an intersection, and then they need to cross this intersection in a safe and optimal manner. Okay, and once you think about optimal, you can think about formulating an optimization problem. So, so this comes from the control community. Basically, they would say, I want to minimize a per vehicle cost. So I sum over all the vehicles 
for each vehicle I would have a cost over a certain time window. And the cost uh, includes the position or the state of the vehicle and also some control actions. And you can have different objectives, right? So one car could really care about having a very smooth drive, so not accelerate or, or brake too much. Another car could really care only about fuel efficiency. Another car will have, wants to have a fun ride, maybe just brake and uh, accelerate all the time. You can do whatever you want here. Okay, so each car has their own objective, and you have constraints for each of the cars. So these are like the dynamics of the cars, and also how much you can brake and accelerate at, at any given time. And in addition, you also have collision avoidance constraints. Cars cannot hit the car in front, they cannot hit the car from the other road. Right. And these co co uh, collision avoidance constraints, they result in coupling of the optimization problems for each of the vehicles, and these need to be resolved. Right. And you can do this either through implicit communication, as we do now when we drive, right? we look at the other car, we, we reason about what they're going to do, and then we make a decision. Or you can do it through explicit communication. And once you have autonomous vehicles and car-to-car -car communication, you can do this explicit communication and thus explicit coordination. Uh, I should also point out that here you have the state of the vehicles, and this state may not be known precisely. Right? So maybe a car has a good idea of where it is itself, but not where all the cars are, are around them. And this information is to be communicated between cars. So communication <coughs> plays multiple roles here. Okay. Communication will be used to collect state information. Communication will be used to set up this, this optimization problem. Right? This needs to be agreed on by all the cars. Communication will be used to solve this optimization problem. And then communication will be used to report the solution to all of the cars, so they all agree. Okay, so there's a big burden here on the communication subsystem. I will split this. So um, as an example of, of how this would work, so you could think of the following scenario where you have two cars that are starting a certain distance away from an intersection on orthogonal roads. So what I'm plotting here is the, the position of the first vehicle on its road, so in a one-dimensional space, the position of the other vehicle on its road in a one-dimensional space, and they want to cross to the intersection. And this, this space here is the intersection. It's written as a block because in the, this two-dimensional space it will just be a block. And the both cars, they start same distance away from the intersection with exactly the same speed. Right. So if they don't do anything, well, they, they will collide. Right. So we run this optimization problem from the control community, uh, or from our colleagues from the control group, and then you get something like this. Okay, so the controller, which is now, for this case, residing in the intersection itself, it's a central controller, receives information from the vehicles. Okay, it knows something wrong is going to happen. It solves this optimization problem, and then it gives commands to each of the cars. So this is the acceleration of the cars. It basically says to one car, you have to go much faster, you have to go much slower, and this results in this difference in the speed profile, and then they cross the intersection in a nice way. And then the control people, they say, problem done. Okay. And I say, no, 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 no. Let's, let's inject some, um, maybe some communication impairments and see what happens. So now it's the same scenario, but I, I, I drop a lot of the data packets. And I only drop data packets in the uplink, meaning from the car to the intersection controller, but the downlink is perfect. So what happens then? So in the beginning, so let's let it play for a second. Okay, so what happened now is the cars are sending to the controller, but the controller never receives the information because there's too many errors due to whatever reason. So there's no change in acceleration, right? Basically, the controller doesn't even know the cars are there. At some point, the packets from the cars will arrive to the controller. What will the controller do? Any guess? Stop everything. Well, the controller will try to solve an optimization problem. And here the optimization problem is um, get the cars through the intersection safely. That's a constraint. And the objective is to minimize deviation from the desired speed and also maximum comfort. So not too much aggressive braking and acceleration. Kay. So the controller now will receive data from the cars. Ah, and what it does, it gives to one car, <laughs> hit, you know, <laughs> pedal to the metal, and to the other car, hit the brakes. Right. Be and because the information came there so late, uh, the cars are, are, are following this command but it was too late uh, and they crash. Right. It's very sad. But there was nobody in the car, there were autonomous cars, it's okay. So in any case, um, the, the communication affects the performance of the control, right? So this is a ju just as an easy example. So we did a much more detailed evaluation where we evaluate the cost, so the value of the objective function, basically the, the comfort of the driver and the deviation from the target speed and the probability of collision. So this tells you um, how often did the solver say the problem was not feasible? And then the cars will inevitably collide. 
And I, I can plot now with different versions of uplink package probability how things behave. So I'm not going to go through this figure in great detail because I'm running out of time. But for instance, you will see that when there's no packet collisions, um, the cost is low. And there's basically, on the right-hand side, no collisions. So this curve goes down very, very fast. There's almost no collisions. And then when you have more and more packet, uh, uplink packet losses, it doesn't affect you so much. And I would say a standard communication uh, system would operate maybe in 20% packet losses, reasonably. It's only when you have very, very high packet losses, then you will see that your cost goes up and you have many collisions. So we saw one of those collisions before. The reason the cost goes up is that even when the cars go through the intersection safely, it came at a very high cost in terms of having to brake and, uh, and accelerate quite a lot. So that's why it's a very expensive maneuver. We did a similar analysis for injecting velo velo velocity uncertainty, position uncertainty, and the combined uncertainties. And we can see all the trade-offs here. I'll skip something, OK? The last area that we're working on is macroscopic traffic control, where we try to adjust the infrastructure in a city to optimize traffic flow. So we're trying to adjust traffic lights, or ramp meters, or smart highways, mm, although yeah, for an urban scenario, or rerouting vehicles to optimize traffic flow. And here, communication comes in in a kind of surprising role. So what we're doing is we're using techniques that were developed, say, 20 years ago in network utility maximization and, and uh, network stability to optimize flow of traffic through a network. So in, rather than sending data packets through a data network, we're sending car packets to a transportation network. And we, we, we can almost use these existing techniques uh, without much modification, but you have to be careful in some ways. right? So for instance, when, when two data packets collide because they're sent at the same time over the same link, and that, I mean, you just retransmit. You cannot retransmit a car. Right? Um, you can add two data packets through network coding, just binary addition. You cannot add two cars. So these are kind of very obvious things. But, so, but after some tweaks, what we can do, for instance, here, this is uh, from a microscopic simulation in Stockholm. During rush hour, we evaluate over time how many cars are, are, are waiting in line or in a traffic jam. Right? And this is um, in red here is when you use standard um, uh, traffic lights with a fixed schedule. And then these are our algorithms here. So but by optimizing um, the network using our, our techniques, which are coming from data networks from the, from the 1990s, we can do much, much better. So we can get this traffic through to the network, through a city much, much more efficiently. I think this is relatively promising. Um, Okay, I will end here. So our road ahead is we believe that there's now uh, a lot of buzz about autonomous driving. And for us, the next thing will be cooperative driving. Okay, this could be just cooperation between, man one ve between two vehicles, many vehicles, or cooperation through the cloud. And in order to solve problems in this area, uh, we need to step out of our own individual domain. So I'm a communication theorist, but I go to control conference and signal processing conference. And I want to learn about all, all of these developments in those conferences. So that, that's why it's exciting for me to be here at IV. If you want to know more about what we're doing, these are all the faculty that I'm connected to in one hop in this area. And if you want me to you know, uh, connect you to them, please let me know. And if you want to know more about what we, what we do, this is a, um, a YouTube uh, page where I have a lot of videos about each of the researchers that I, I, I work with. Uh, and they describe in one or two minutes what they're doing. So this can give you more of an idea of our activities. OK, thank you. Thank you.